P.1. Happiness is a natural and mutual goal for all people regardless of their beliefs. It is a product of our core instincts of gentleness and compassion and can be achieved by meditation. Happiness is a mutual goal for humans, regardless of religion. It can be achieved through training the mind. This includes identifying the habits or things that cause sadness and reducing them whilst cultivating those that bring happiness. Happiness is not a self-centered goal. Happy people are more sociable, effectively spreading happiness around unlike unhappy people who brood and sulk. Happy people are also more forgiving and loving. Happiness seeks to be shared with others. Happy people are more willing to share their happiness. They are more likely to lend a helping hand to a stranger and they are better at relating with people. A motorist is more likely to let another get in front of him if the traffic jam finally eases up and is no longer stuck. A good mood equals a good person. But where does happiness come from? And how do we get it? The path to happiness involves learning to identify negative and positive emotions and their respective effects on our minds. After which, you must commit to willful cultivation of a kind and compassionate mindset. This way, you are psychologically healthy which translates to a state of happiness. It is often thought that at our core, we are selfish and aggressive, but in truth, we are innately compassionate and kind. Happiness comes first from attaining emotional intelligence and showing compassion to others. If ever you feel unsure about how to interact with people due to their mean or violent demeanor, remember that as humans, we have at our core the need to be gentle, compassionate, and kind. Once you remember that, you'll find it much easier to see past their actions. The author claims that although violence and aggression are real emotions, they do not stem from our innate instincts. Instead, they are a product of intelligence, a need to survive as we evolved. Anger and aggression are a response to danger or threat. You must approach people armed with the knowledge that their outbursts aren't their fault, but the result of frustration or sense danger. A better understanding of people and why they feel these dark emotions will make it easier to interact with them without stirring up further frustration. Key point two. A happy soul is ready to open up to loved ones and friends and shows utmost compassion in his her dealings with them. As humans, we tend to feel lonely because we expect a certain level of openness and warmth before we show it to them. Loneliness, according to the Dalai Lama, is a product of our negligence of the importance of the many people we come across. The Dalai Lama believes that to fight loneliness is to approach people from a standpoint of openness and warmth, even if they turn down your offer of a gentle exchange, you leave the scene feeling no regret because you acted in your good nature. We are all interdependent, and each one of us is part of a large wheel that runs perpetually. If you can recognize this system and yours and everyone else's place in it, you will move a step closer to feeling less lonely. If we let regret and the pain of rejection linger, we risk sinking into loneliness. Intimacy, as a tool for ultimate mental well-being and happiness, should also be used effectively. As such, there is a need to deepen our intimacy with others. This is achieved by first establishing empathy. Empathy is the act of juxtaposing oneself in the stead of the next person and attempting to feel the things they feel. It is a profound gesture and a surefire way. To be truly happy is to be wholly compassionate with your fellow man-woman, and to have compassion is to breed empathy. Empathy and compassion find roots in our need for intimacy, forming close relationships. With empathy, we can hope to find and sustain happiness through compassion. This kind of relationship takes a lot of compassion, but compassion can be misconstrued and twisted. The Dalai Lama says there are two kinds of compassion. One labored with forceful attachment to a person, the other is pure and selfless without a desire to imprison the person in our lives. This compassion seeks to understand and appreciate the you can even help them through it. What is the place of compassion and what are the benefits? To our DNA. It is increasingly beneficial to cultivate compassion because it is responsible for overall good mental health. A compassionate individual is one who doesn't seek conflict. And as such, he's easier to talk to. In being compassionate and finding happiness, you have been able to water compassion in the next person. This interconnectivity of souls is a highly enlightening and beneficial experience. 
Key point three. Suffering is an inevitable part of our existence, and until we come to terms with its inevitable nature, we will continue to be tossed to and fro by whatever bout of suffering we experience. Suffering, although a great discomfort, is a part of our lives. It signifies the sum of bad things that can happen to us at a particular time or over some time. The author believes that we are often overwhelmed by our suffering because we fail to see its relevance. The whole world is going through suffering and will continue to do so perpetually. You must recognize that it is inevitable. Suffering and joy are two sides of a coin and you must approach each day with the expectation of either. Suffering isn't a punishment for some crime you committed, but an essential part of your existence. As much as suffering is a part of human existence, there are also various forms. One of note is the one we create and feed ourselves. Oftentimes, when we experience suffering as a result of either an encounter with other people or circumstances beyond our control, we tend to drag the memory long after the day it occurred. This is often because we haven't forgiven the persons who wronged us or we haven't forgiven ourselves. We must learn to let go of past grievances and forgive whoever had offended us in the past and move on from the memories. It is the only way to truly attain happiness. We must forgive those who offend us and seek only to live peaceably. It can be difficult to forgive someone who wronged us, someone whom we have tagged as an enemy, but the author believes that there is a way to do so without much effort. To truly forgive an enemy, you must view the enemy from a different viewpoint, and instead of plotting revenge, forgive them. Is there a meaning to all this suffering? In some religious beliefs, suffering is a way to bring us closer to a higher spiritual meaning. So, when one suffers, it should be seen as a tool for spiritual upliftment, a chance to be vulnerable enough to receive spiritual recourse. Suffering can either make us stronger and ready to face whatever else is thrown at us, but it can also make us vulnerable and appreciative of our place in the universe. Humans can endure a great amount of suffering if they know it was for a greater purpose or meaning, so when we suffer, instead of rejecting it altogether, think of it as a chance to either be a stronger individual or a more compassionate, open soul. Did you know? The Dalai Lama has a knack for repairing wristwatches. Key point four. To truly change your state of mind into one of real compassion, peace, and happiness, you must be determined to take the right action to effect a lasting change. It can be difficult to change the way we think, feel, and see the world in general because many experiences we might have had in the past or are having right now. The author has outlined a few ways to change just how we think and how that can lead to happiness. If we change how we see the world, we can change the world. It requires a strong determination to take matters into your own hands and start on a path to change. It can be hard to generate enough enthusiasm to kick the old, familiar habits to the curb. If you wish to learn a new healthy but unfamiliar habit, you must first start to consciously practice it until it becomes a part of your routine. Only then can you accept the positive change it brings with it. It is easy to get distracted, discouraged, and derailed from your path to happiness, and when you do get these feelings, it pays to respond with a positive outlook. This isn't to say you should deny reality, but that you accept it and identify its positive aspects. It is important to let go of injurious thoughts that spring up in our times of stress. Now, we must address the chief emotions responsible for the negative thoughts and mindset we are trying to rid ourselves of anger and hatred. As humans, we are very prone to anger and hatred because of our vindictive nature. Anger and hatred, although strong emotions, can be put under control, tamed, and ultimately reduced to the barest minimum. The problem with anger and hatred is that they are an enemy, but unlike other enemies, these emotions reside within us, feed off us, and continue to grow. But this is an advantage because unlike any other enemy, you have control of this enemy and can determine just how much influence it has on you and your general mood. Patience and tolerance are the keys to a healthier life. When you are patient and tolerant, a lot of things no longer have a dire effect on your well-being. A patient and tolerant mind will forgive past wrongs and let go of hurtful memories. This, in turn, translates into a kind of peace and happiness that is difficult to lose. Love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. 
Without them, humanity cannot survive. The Dalai Lama Key point 5 Anxiety is an enemy to us reaching our true potential and can be a hindrance to a truly happy existence, and only with intentional positive action and thought can we rid ourselves of its harmful effects. Anxiety is one of humanity's greatest chinks in our proverbial armor. It is an illogical yet logical assumptive reaction that can manifest in the strangest of ways. Some liken it to fear since it operates along the same lines, so we will discuss them together, fear and anxiety. Anxiety is a more potent enemy than fear. It feeds on our willingness to think outside of logic. First, anxiety and fear can be good. There are scenarios where fear is healthy and a needed cautionary prompt. But other times, it can be a crippling factor that causes you to malfunction as a person, socially and otherwise. It can be a real bother, especially since it makes it difficult to properly navigate our daily lives. This is why we need to rid of or reduce the effects of anxiety. Anxiety must be put under submission and fast before it wrecks irreparable damage. One way to do that is by cognitive intervention. This involves challenging the anxiety and the thoughts it generates with positive thoughts instead. So, when you are confronted by a negative thought, you respond with a positive one. For example, anxiety says you'll screw up a presentation, but instead of believing it, you respond with, I don't aim to impress, but to touch lives with my words, and you'll feel a weight lift off your shoulders. Key point six, finding lasting solutions to the plague of anxiety. Another method is identifying the motives behind every action you feel anxious about. This is tied into the determination and enthusiasm discussed earlier. When you discover the motives behind your intended action, all becomes clearer and easier for you. When you are worried about performance, instead of focusing on your competence, focus on the joy you are about to share with the audience and you'll find it easier to do it. Focus on the satisfaction you'll get when you complete the task and watch the anxiety fade away. Anxiety sometimes stems from low self-esteem and this might arguably be the worst kind. This kind of anxiety isn't suggesting that you are afraid to do something. It tells you that you cannot and will not be able to. An inferiority complex is a real issue in our world today and it affects quite some people, maybe even you. So how do you build up self-esteem? By first being honest with yourself. Anxiety and low self-esteem will always flood your mind with lies that might be believable but are lies regardless. Being honest with oneself is accepting our strengths and weaknesses and working with them as they are. Self-deceit is a dangerous ally to seek shelter with. You must accept your strengths and weaknesses. The inferiority complex is wrong but it keeps you under because you believe it. You must find the truth for yourself. You are capable of a lot of greatness and you have the potential to do great things. Conclusion Every human is created equal in their search for happiness, and as such, it is a mutual goal regardless of race, faith, or background. The path to happiness is simple and clear. It is made easier by mental practices that calm the mind and deepen compassion. But of all the many ways to find and sustain happiness, the best one is developing a healthy spiritual life. Surprisingly, it encompasses all the many ways to ascend to a healthier mindset. Faith teaches compassion, kindness, confidence, and much more. Each human is daily seeking to be happy. You too can lend a helping hand by being patient and tolerant, in that way, teaching them to do the same to you. Compassion and empathy are two pivotal parts of attaining true happiness. A compassionate heart will always see cause to reach out and help as many as they can, spreading joy and happiness as they go. Empathy is also an important aspect. Without it, it would be impossible to truly feel the pain of those we wish to help. Empathy puts us in their shoes so we feel what they feel and understand just what they need to be happy. Empathy and compassion go hand in hand, but without patience and tolerance, it might be a trying venture to spread happiness, especially to those reluctant to receive it in the first place. The art of happiness is attaining happiness and seeking to spread it. Try this. Take out time, maybe 20, 30 minutes a day, to practice meditation or prayers before you head out, then do the same when you get back to your home. 